In our previous lecture, I spoke about the relationship between the Bible and the ancient Near Eastern texts. And we entered into some of the conversations, some of the controversies from the 19th and early 20th centuries about the relationship between myths told in these newly discovered texts, then newly discovered texts, and the material in the Bible of which all educated Westerners were familiar. In today's lecture, we will focus on the texts of the Near East themselves and on polytheistic material, not on biblical material, but on material that describes the gods. Because in both Egypt and Mesopotamia, the religious systems were organized around beliefs in a multiplicity of gods, in pantheons of deities. I will discuss the process by which these religious systems organized the gods. From our vantage point, looking back at history, we can see a system evolving. There were individual gods, and eventually they became organized into a system. Manifestations of nature, such as rivers, the sea, stars, vegetation, wild animals, these became symbols of gods. They were thought often to be inhabited by gods. And then these manifestations were worshipped by these ancient peoples. The purpose of humans, according to many myths in Mesopotamia and in Egypt, was to serve the gods. That's why humans were created. And this wasn't only an abstract idea. In a later lecture, I will read to you from a myth which describes the process, the event at which there's a decision that the gods need help make people. They have work to do. It's like a cheap labor force create human beings. So our whole purpose here on earth is to serve the gods. And of course, this reverberates, some would say develops into the later idea in the monotheistic religions that the purpose of humanity is to serve the one God. So you can see there's a continuum between these ancient ideas and our modern ideas. Once you have gods, you have them symbolized or personified. You need a system of priesthood to organize the worship and the service of the gods. This too is an administrative question. And um, in my lecture, I will look at six gods on each side. That is six gods in the Mesopotamian system, six gods in the Egyptian system. And I will make some remarks comparing them. Now in Egypt, let's begin with Egypt. In the third millennium BC, Again, to remind us of our dating system, that is between 3000 and 2000 BC, we have the full flowering of ancient Egypt in the middle of that period, in approximately 2600 to 2500, we have the building of the pyramids and all that they symbolize. So in this period, we have Egyptian culture and religion organizing itself. And the god who presides over the idea of administration and kingship is the first of the gods I'd like to discuss, Horus, who is symbolized by the falcon. At first, Horus is a regional god in Upper Egypt, and he's identified with the idea of the rule of Upper Egypt. In fact, many of the gods I'm going to speak of in this lecture, both in Mesopotamia and in Egypt, start regional. It's they start local and they go global. You could think of them like politicians. They might be a good governor or mayor or senator. They'll go for national office. By the way, these gods had proponents, much like political lobbying groups, who pushed them. And we know something about this. They weren't cynical about it. They believed in these gods. They said, my god, the god of my locality, does a very good job. They didn't quite say elect him to be the national god, but they said he should be worshipped on a national level. In fact, later in history, we moved to the idea of worshipping the god on an international level. We go from the local to the national to the international. Horus, the pharaoh, the ruler of Egypt, when he became the ruler, was given a Horus name. 
And this idea of the falcon god is associated with rulership was developed into the idea of the Horus family. So other gods were joined in in this pantheon. They include Osiris, Isis, and Set. Osiris was first known in a regional connection also. This is in the other part of Egypt, in the Nile Delta. And when you see him depicted, he's a mummiform character. He's wrapped in the linens of the mummy. Now, in the thinking about kingship in Egypt, the idea was that the pharaoh, when living, is Horus. In death, he's transformed into the god Osiris. And this is a cyclical pattern, because in a sense, the god is reborn with the accession of the new king into Horus again. So we have Horus to Osiris to Horus to Osiris. And this succession of kings and succession of the gods brought a stability to Egyptian thought and to Egyptian society. That is, they had the idea of eternally continuing kingship and godship. Now, in the last two or three minutes, I tried to succinctly organize this idea, but I'd like to tell you that this is a very modern way of expressing it. What I just said cannot be found in the ancient Egyptian writings. Uh, they talk about Horus. They talk about Osiris. They speak about dying and being reborn. But they don't say we are going to achieve stability by having a succession of kings. This is modern theorizing. And something we need to be aware of when we study and read about the ancient Near East. It's the job of scholars today, it's my job, to make sense of this ancient world. In making sense of it, I'm using modern categories of thought. Categories of thought that these ancient peoples did not necessarily use. Not that they weren't capable of it. That's something we need to be careful about saying. They had the same capabilities we did. They thought differently about these issues. Often they thought concretely and symbolically. When they thought abstractly, they spoke about it in a concrete way. Osiris functions on this meta level. He functions on the level of the king dies and the king is manifest anew. He also functions as a guide to the dead. When one dies, one is led to and through the underworld by Osiris. And I'd like to read to you from a text from the Egyptian Book of the Dead, really more properly, the Egyptian Books of the Dead. This is a very mysterious title that students of the occult like, but the truth is it's not very mysterious. What it is is a collection of prayers and incantations which were used at rituals and Osiris is continually invoked. The reference in this incantation is to Ani, A-N-I, the scribe for whom this text was prepared. Ye who open the way and lo lay open the paths to perfected souls in the hall of Osiris, open the way and lay open to path and lay open the paths to the soul of Osiris the scribe and steward of all the divine offerings, Ani, who is triumphant with you. Here, the ritual practitioner is trying to achieve identification between Ani, the departed scribe, and Osiris, the god. May he enter in with a bold heart, and may he come forth in peace from the house of Osiris. May he not be rejected. May he not be turned back. May he enter in as he pleaseth. May he come forth as he desireth, and may he be victorious. May his bidding be done in the house of Osiris. May he walk and may he speak with you. May he have a glorified soul along with you. He hath not been found wanting there, and the balance is rid of his trial. This is a reference to the judgment of the dead. The deceased is judged according to his deeds, and Osiris plays a role in this. 
So we're going to see Osiris both on the national level and on the personal level. We could also, hearkening back to our theme of multiple approaches to any one myth, we could also use the psychological approaches, psychological approach to myths, which I've mentioned a number of times, uh, an approach outlined in the writings of Freud and especially in the writings of Jung, in which they see ancient myths as facilitating human confrontation with ultimate questions. So the question of death is dealt with through the figure of Osiris. Death is inevitable. Death must be faced. There is an afterlife of sorts over which Osiris presides. To be led to it, we need the ritual text. So we could think of the combination of the ritual approach and the psychological approach to make sense in our terms of the god Osiris. Other Egyptian deities associated with Horus and Osiris include Isis, the goddess of kingship. And in Egyptian, her name means throne. She's the throne on which kingship rests. She is both wife and sister to Osiris. And she and Osiris ruled Egypt until challenged by Set. And Horus is the son of Isis and Osiris, but um, his birth comes about in a very curious fashion, which we'll get to in a moment. Um, she is wife and sister to Osiris. This reminds us that among royalty in Egypt, we on occasion find brother-sister marriage. This was not thought of as incest, as the violation of some taboo. Actually, it was thought of as something sacred. It was not practiced throughout the life of the common people, but it was something that we find actually enjoined upon members of the royalty at certain times, that a brother had to marry a sister. So we find this mirrored also in the life of the gods. Again, the life of the gods is a mirror of the life of royalty. This would speak to the theory of myth as reflecting historical reality, but reflecting it in an oblique fashion, not in a direct way. Let us move to Set spelled S-E-T or sometimes S-E-T-H. A problem with the S-E-T-H spelling is that the name could be confused with Seth in the Bible, another figure from the ancient Near East. Seth is the child of Adam and Eve, a very different kind of figure. So pronounced Set, he's the god of chaos and disorder. And he is sometimes identified with the Semitic god Baal. He battles with Osiris, he defeats and kills him, and Isis revives Osiris. These uh, myths are really wonderful. Um, what is said in that great movie about Jamaica, the harder they come, hero no can die till end of movie, is not true about Egyptian myths. The hero can die and the hero can be brought back. The hero is brought back Osiris is brought back. In fact, he's brought back and he's able to impregnate his wife, right? which is a real revival, a real resuscitation. And Horus is the child of this pregnancy. Now, Horus and Set then go to war. Abstracting again, we could think of this as order, as battling chaos. And this is a constant theme in ancient Egyptian culture in expression of ideas of kingship administration, there are the forces of chaos. They could be seen as in the lower realm. Over them are the forces of order. The forces of order not only have to win, they have to constantly ward off the threat that chaos will erupt again. You could see it as a kind of physical phenomenon, like a volcano or a storm erupting. Order and chaos contending. 